This is beautiful. But let's go sapphire panning. Hello and welcome back to the latest rock record. Let's talk some rocks. Okay, so this area of Montana is actually pretty famous for lots of geology and mining. There's a ton of cool stuff to see. Um, old mining districts and sapphires. And Montana is actually pretty famous for its sapphires. The most famous being the Yogo Sapphire, which is not found in this area, but um, it's a beautiful natural cornflower blue sapphire and it is the only North American gem on the crown jewels. So fun fact. Um, however, Montana sapphires in general are just pretty famous. We have a lot of them. And so I'm super excited to go see this today. But I know that the first thing you're thinking is, Jess, if this area is so famous for mining and sapphires, why didn't you bring your camera? I don't want to talk about it, okay? <laughs> um, no, for real, I didn't think that there was anything open this early in the year. It's only the first weekend in May, uh, so I'm not even sure any of this is going to be open. In 1865, an incredible discovery was made by gold miners panning along the Missouri River near Helena, Montana. Among the flecks of gold in their pans were these small, brilliant stones of incredible hardness and clarity. Almost like tiny, lumpy marbles. Little did they know, these were some of the first sapphires ever found in Montana, an unexpected treasure in the American West. These washings contained not just gold, but a rainbow of these gemstones, pale greens, blues, and the occasional rare, treasured dark blues. At first, these miners had thought they found quartz, emeralds, or even diamonds. But testing of these stones soon revealed the real prize, genuine sapphires. This kicked off a sapphire mining rush along the Missouri River near Helena. Miners staked claims on the riverbank gravel bars like El Dorado Bar, Ruby Bar, and French Bar, using techniques like drifting tunnels and high-pressure hydraulic mining to extract these treasures. El Dorado Bar proved to be the mother load. It is estimated that 10 to 15 million carats were produced from this area, around 2 to 3 tons of sapphires. Most of these were the signature pale green Montana hues. By 1889, Montana's fancy sapphires were being showcased at major exhibitions by companies like Tiffany & Co. Prospectors were swarming the region and corporations were buying up mining claims by the acre. However, the 1890s economic downturn and the discovery of the famed blue sapphires at Yogo Gulch, which you've probably heard of, dampened the Missouri River fever. Still, small-scale operations continued working these sapphire bars over the decades. When World War II caused a shortage of industrial sapphires from Europe, one company was allowed to dredge El Dorado Bar and provide vital gemstones for the war effort's precision bearings. Today, large-scale commercial mining of these sapphires has faded. However, the lure of finding your own famous Montana sapphire lives on. Recreational mines now operate on some of the historic bars, allowing visitors to take home a little piece of gemstone history from the great American sapphire rush. This is what we're visiting today, I'm digging up gravel here at Spokane Bar, and the owners also now own the famous El Dorado Bar that you can pan at by appointment. Let's dig in. Okay, so they have several options here. Um, I'm going to try two of them. So the first one is going to go try my hand at hand digging on their little site. Um, it's $10 for a five gallon bucket. Um, so we're gonna go give it a shot, but knowing that I probably won't find anything with that. Um, I also bought a bag of concentrate. Their smallest bag is $50. So then we'll try our hand at that and see if we can find something. All right, so we made it to the dig site. Had a nice little introduction on how to do this. But for real, look at this view. And he was nice enough to let the girls run, which is really nice. So I guess let's dig some dirt. While most precious gemstones form deep in the Earth's crust, Montana's sapphires had their genesis in the ancient molten rocks that pushed up to create the rugged Rocky Mountains eons ago. It all starts with molten rock called magma welling up from deep inside the Earth's crust long ago. These large blobs of super hot magma pushed up through weaknesses in the outermost rocky layers, slowly cooling into a type of igneous rock called diorite. This diorite contained aluminum-rich minerals like feldspar. Over vast spans of time, these aluminum minerals near the surface were altered by water, heat, and pressure into an entirely new mineral. This mineral is called corundum, 
While that may not be a name that you're familiar with, you definitely know it's Gemstone Varieties. You could come help, you know. So sapphires are a gem version of the mineral corundum. corundum. If I could pronounce it right, that'd be great. The Big Belt Mountains, northeast of Helena, contain the largest areas of this ancient sapphire-bearing diorite from the Precambrian area. As these rocks eroded over millions of years, the newly formed sapphire crystals were freed and carried away by streams and rivers. Now, sapphires being corundum, corundum are extremely hard on the most hardness scale, coming in at a 9. Now, for reference, talc, which you can scratch just in general, like with your fingernail, is a 1. A diamond, which we think of as pretty much the hardest material, right, is a 10. So corundum, sapphires, rubies, all of these being 9 means that they're pretty stinking hard, which is why you find them often in alluvial deposits after all of this other stuff has been eroded away. During the last Great Ice Age, around 2 million years ago, massive glaciers advanced and retreated across western Montana. These powerful rivers of ice scoured deep valleys, while glacial meltwaters sorted and transported gravels, including those prized sapphire crystals. One of these ancient glacial rivers left its mark in the form of a strath terrace. A strath terrace is an erosional remnant of an elevated broad river valley. These terraces are Pleistocene age, formed by erosion of rocks of the belt supergroup in the area. Sapphire-bearing gravel was deposited on these terraces. These terraces that are located along the Missouri River are generally referred to as bars or gravel bars. While you're panning at Spokane Bar along Hauser Lake, you can still find those Ice Age gravels packed with a rainbow of sapphires. The gravels of Spokane Bar are only a few feet deep, and they contain a mix of weathered rocks, tan quartzites, dark basalts, granites, and even glimmers of metamorphic gneisses that hint at the bar's ancient origins. So what else are we finding in this gravel store? We have some agates, petrified wood, he said. We have some quartzite, a little bit of limestone. This is from the Boulder Batholith. Uh, it is a granite. So there's actually a lot of cool rocks within this gravel itself that you could easily spend some time digging around. <laughs> there is no way. I literally was just shaking and this showed up. So how do you know if a sapphire is a Montana sapphire? Most likely a jeweler will be able to tell you. You may not know from just looking at it. Sapphires from this area of Montana have a few distinguishing features. First off, on the surface of the sapphire might be little tiny pieces of spinel. This is found in depressions on 25 to 50 percent of the Missouri River sapphires, but not on sapphires from other alluvial deposits. Again, this is not something you'd be able to see with your naked eye by any means. <laughs> if you're looking at a sapphire in its raw form, Missouri River sapphires tend to be a little bit more angular than either Rock Creek or Dry Cottonwood Creek sapphires. Some noteworthy sapphires that have come from this area of Montana are the 64.7 carat stone that I mentioned earlier. In September 1973, Mac Mater Jr. discovered a 24 carat sapphire. This sapphire, named Big Sky Sapphire, is 12.54 carats cut. In 2012, Bruce Scharf recovered a green sapphire from El Dorado Bar that weighed 32 carats. More recently, in 2016, Blaze Wharton recovered a tabular sapphire from the El Dorado Bar that weighed 37.78 carats. Okay, so I thought you got one five gallon bucket of like dirt to sift and she ends up with this. No, you get one five gallon bucket of this. 10 bucks, so that's pretty good. And then the little thing I found, we got as topaz, so that's super exciting fun little thing, but I'm still looking for some sapphires. All right, so as I said, we are actually entitled to a five gallon bucket of gravel with our $10, but these guys are over it. So I think we're gonna go back and see if we can pan some. <laughs> All right, dogs are loaded up. Let's go pan some gravel. All right, so 
been instructed. Let's see if I can follow the instructions. So we need three to four double hands of gravel. All right, now we take it to the water. Okay, y'all, hi, just from the future here. Um, I'm gonna pop in and give you all a better demo of how to sapphire pan because the demo that I filmed was really terrible trying to do it one-handed. Um, and it's really easy to do at home. You can order you can order concentrate from a lot of the sapphire places online. You can get a round sapphire pan from Amazon for pretty cheap. And all you gotta do is fill up the kiddie pool. So you get double the fun. Let me show ya. All right, so the concept for this is the same as the square pan. I think the square pan just makes it easier to shake and rotate, but this should be just fine. All right, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna submerge the pan in water. Hopefully your kiddie pool is deeper than mine. And then what you're gonna do is shake it back and forth. And the goal is to move that heavier stuff to the center. So up and down to flatten it out. Peter totter to move to the center, okay? And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna rotate 90 degrees. Same thing, up and down. Level, flatten it out. Submerge it in enough water to move that rock into your container. I have a little bit too much rock in mine, so uh, it's something to play around with in your pan. All right, up and down, flatten this baby out, and see your pepper. You want to try and keep it flat. Rotate, up and down. Okay, fancy sponge into this board. Okay, so now if I did this right, all of the heavy material should be in the center. And I think I have a good sign. It's hard to see. Let me switch the camera. Did you see it? Right here in a little blue sapphire. Pretty exciting. Then, if you're not seeing any that stick out at you, he said to start at the side and slowly start sifting through it, just in case you didn't shake it good enough. Okay, I don't have a lot of confidence in my own digging skills, so, I also got a bag of concentrate that we're gonna try. <laughs> you may not know this, but many precious gemstones are subjected to heat treatment in order to enhance their color. Now this doesn't have anything to do with the quality of the sapphire or anything, it's just a color enhancement. It's actually a recreation of what happens geologically in the ground while the crystal is growing. Many gemstones crystallize under intense heat and pressure. So basically what they do to enhance the color is put it in an incubator to let it cook a little bit longer. So what happens is the crystal is essentially put into an oven at a thousand or more degrees Celsius for a period of time. The amount of time really depends on the original crystal, as some sapphires will be lightly heated and others will be heated a little bit more. This results in varying color enhancement. Heat treatment is not considered a bad thing by any means, so if you have a stone that's been heat treated, it's not a big deal. There are two clear reasons why heat treatment is so widely accepted. The first is that all this practice does is recreate a natural process. The second reason is there are generally no outside chemicals used, just heating. So when you're visiting areas like this and panning your own sapphires, you may notice that the colors are slightly more pale than what you've seen in rings or earrings or jewelry. This is not a big deal. Most of the panning places have connections to jewelers that can heat treat this gem and cut it for you and it makes a beautiful stone. As I said, there are many places to pan for sapphires in Montana, and I highly recommend finding one near you on your next trip over here. The one that I visited today was called Spokane Bar, and you will find it near Helena, Montana. Another one of my favorite places that I've panned for sapphires was Gem Mountain in Phillipsburg, Montana. So if you're in that area, going between Yellowstone and Glacier, that's also a great stop. 
Of course, if you're not planning to visit Montana anytime soon, but you are fascinated by Montana sapphires, stop by your local jeweler and ask to see a Yogo Sapphire or Montana Sapphire to get an up-close view of these great, beautiful sapphires in person. Much of the information about Montana sapphires came from a report titled Sapphire Deposits Along the Missouri River Near Helena, Montana by Richard B. Berg and Martin T. Landry. This is Bulletin 136 by the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology in 2018 and is available for download if you're interested in finding out more information. As always, thank you for watching the Rock Record and I will see you again soon.